Most people see fish like they do vegetables, a rich, tasty, healthy, and readily available food source. But fish are so much more. They're builders, athletes, tricksters, mountaineers, even role model fathers. They have endless energy to fight for life and race for future generations. They feed the planet, not just the human population, but entire ecosystems. Our world relies on the slippery and superb family of fish. Following their scaly trail for a year, this is their story. It's the dead of winter. Giants are on the move. What could be big enough to drive huge humpback whales to divert from their migration? Herring. Ten billion of them, overwintering in the cool, dark waters of Norway's fjords. The herring aren't here to feed. They're just hanging out, away from rough waters, until conditions are right for them to head to open seas to spawn. The fish are not stupid. They know predators stalk the water, so they bunch together in tight groups and stay close to the sea floor. But the humpback whales have unlikely partners in crime. Orcas. In other parts of the world and other times of the year, they can be arch enemies. But now, with such an abundance of fish, they seem to hunt under a truce. The orca silently dive together, swimming under the vast mass of herring. They gradually push the fish towards the surface, The water's surface will act as a barrier against which they can trap the heron. Orcas have many hunting techniques. The one they use now is brute force. The whales approach side on and slap the fish with their tails. The blow and the pressure waves produced are so strong that they stun the heron. The orca can then pick them off at their leisure. They may eat 200 fish a day, so it will take quite a while to hoover up their quota. But humpback whales, like their helpings, supersized. Now that the orca have the herring pinned against the surface, the humpbacks can target the densest patch. They throw open their mouths and allow folds in the throat to expand. Tons of water flows in, dragging hundreds of herring with it. The whales can push out the water, knowing the fish will be trapped against their baleen plates. The net of bristles that hang from the roofs of their mouths. 
the whales can swallow the mouthful of fish and line up for another helping. It seems like carnage on a grand scale, but the whales barely dent the herring's vast numbers. While they feed, the predators leave a trail of destruction. But nothing goes to waste. Gulls drop in for drums. Other fish make the most of the handouts. And on the seafloor, a wealth of invertebrates welcome the feast. In one small moment, the herring is feeding an entire food chain, from top to bottom. And that is the amazing thing about fish. They're vital to supporting healthy seas and even terrestrial environments. When spring eventually reaches the north, the surviving herring will head out of the fjords to begin their life cycle. And they're not alone. A new year is starting for the world's nearly 34,000 species of fish. While ocean species can retreat to escape the winter, it's a lot harder for the fish confined to fresh water. Deeper corners of lakes can be stacked. In this case, catfish rely on the oxygen trapped beneath the ice to see them through. Life moves slowly in the cold dark. Not all of the fish community will make it. but their frozen bodies become a larder that keeps other creatures alive. Winter's own deep freeze. The cruel winters of the north give fish a tough time. But nearer the equator, fortune swings the other way. The rainforest lives up to its name. It rains a lot year round, but in winter, the dam bursts. Normally the Amazon River flows through the forest. Its banks a barrier to fish, but not anymore. The flooded river brings new opportunities setting the aquatic creatures free to explore the forest. Here, some of the dramatic diversity of the fish world is revealed. A freshwater ray, normally hunting over shallow sandbanks, can explore the forest canopy. At three meters long, the arapaima is one of the world's largest freshwater fish. With freedom to roam, it can hunt through the jungle, vacuuming up small animals in its huge mouth. While its cousin, the araana, has its own stealth technique. Thanks to the flood water, most rainforest animals are in easy reach, but there are some managing to keep their heads above water. But the Araana is ready, poised like a coiled spring. It's been known to jump two meters out of the water to snatch prey. While south of the equator it floods, 
To the north, water is running low. In the equatorial Congo, a pumping gill betrays its owner, the peculiar West African lungfish, an ancient species. The lungfish has basic lungs. Its gills are virtually worthless. The fish pumps with its mouth to draw in water, or it can swim to the surface and gulp a mouthful of air. As its home dries, becoming shallower, oxygen levels drop. The fish needs air to stay alive. Surfacing has its drawbacks. The shoebill's bizarre huge beak is ideal for snatching slippery lungfish. It's the end of the line for one lungfish, but those who escape the beak face bigger challenges. Water is a commodity that they can't take for granted. But while some might end up just another fish out of water, the lungfish have got it covered. Before it has a chance to bake hard, the fish digs itself a chamber into the mud. Inside, it will secrete an oozy, fish slime cocoon to protect its skin. And it will estiovate, shutting down its body like a hibernating mammal until the water returns. Spring comes slowly in the north, but there are fish that can't wait to get their year started. Pike are one of the first to spawn. Snow melt water flowing into a lake is churned up and therefore rich in oxygen, an ideal place for a nursery. So the fish fight the current. But the fast flowing and very shallow water is not the only challenge they face. Female pike are much bigger than the males and armed with powerful jaws and sharp teeth. Pike deserve their aggressive reputation. But fortunately for the boys, during the mating season, the females experience attack inhibition. Their desire to strike is temporarily put on hold. A window the males need to complete their mission. They can wriggle up against the girls, releasing sperm as she deposits eggs. Not the most attentive parents, their job is done, and they return to the lake. After a few weeks, as spring begins to warm the water of the lake, the pike eggs are ready to hatch. The tiny larvae wriggle free. There's hardly any trace of their dynamic, predatory parents. They look more like tadpoles than fish. Their bodies are little more than a spine. The bulbous bellies are yolk sacs, food stores that they will gradually absorb over the next few days. Throughout the watery world, changes are afoot. Many fish choose rivers to spawn because the fast-flowing water is rich in oxygen and carries nutrients from rain runoff in the high country, everything a baby fish might need. A male bullhead diligently stands guard over his eggs. It's a healthy nursery. His vigil will last for a month. Though being in the shallower water does have its drawbacks.
Fish feed many hungry mouths, but fish kind has countless adaptations to fight back. This one has found a way to fortify its nursery. The male bitterling hovers in the perfect spot and waits for the ladies. He's guiding them to a mussel bed. Another male shows up, but he's not going to let anyone else muscle in on his muscles. The mussels sit on the river bed and siphon water, sucking it in through a tube, partly to take in oxygen, but also to filter out tiny particles of food. And it's this constant billowing that the fish exploit. The females have long ovipositors, egg-laying tubes, and can release their eggs directly into the siphon of the shellfish. The mussel unwittingly sucks the eggs into its gills. The eggs will quickly hatch, but they will stay inside the gills for about a month, stealing food particles sucked in by their host until they are bigger and can brave the world outside. It's shellfish exploitation, pure and simple. But the pendulum can swing both ways. In spring, many fish are on the move to their spawning grounds. In the case of a black bass, bringing it to the home of a master of deceit. It's no coincidence that the mantle of this wavy rayed lamp mussel is the size, shape and color of a minnow. The bass is working hard fighting the current to deliver its eggs. It's energy demanding and the fish is hungry. It can't resist an easy meal. But at the precise moment that it tries to engulf a minnow, the mussel releases thousands of larvae into its mouth. The parasitic larvae will latch onto the fish's gills, absorbing nutrients from its blood. While they freeload, they get a ride upstream, where they'll drop off and colonize another part of the river. Meter-long asp are on the move. They live their lives in lakes, but spring triggers a deep desire to travel. The males, led by genetic programming, head into streams. After a frantic swim, the males have arrived. Males wrestle as they go. The birds hold back, spectating. Something much bigger is heading their way. The fish females arrive. The males vie, trying to draw them to their patch of river. Those that are ready release their eggs. The sticky eggs glue themselves to the vegetation. Catfish and the egrets above move in. This is what they've been waiting for. An endless supply of caviar. Or the little fish that feed on it.
Because of all the hungry mouths, most of the fish wait for nightfall. Under the stars, they have the river to themselves. There are 10 males to every female, so the smaller boys must work hard, vibrating to try and entice a female. Dawn sees more changes. Sunrise lights another love nest. The male stickleback, with his proud red breast puffed up, has painstakingly built a green tent of algae. The weed is glued together with a special secretion from his kidneys. With proof of his homemaking skills complete, he advertises for occupants. And soon the females are lining up. Each one takes its turn to check into his bachelor pad to lay their eggs. The male discreetly follows, dropping sperm to fertilize the eggs. He doesn't limit the number of lady callers and any eggs left in his care will be guarded for a week until they hatch. Fish often make terrific dads, and not just in streams. Cold, dark, salty seas are a difficult place to exist, let alone raise young. It takes care and determination. Lumpfish are ugly cute. Round, warty blobs of fish that inhabit the deep seas far offshore. The adult fish swim into coastal waters to spawn. The male selects a nest on a rock face in the turbulent tidal zone. The females are larger to accommodate huge ovaries. If she likes the spot, she will lay more than 100,000 eggs. But then she'll head offshore. Babysitting duty will fall entirely to dad. Part of the reason for the lump sucker's strange shape is that its squat, flat body and stiff pelvic fins form a suction cup to help anchor him to the rocks, pulling against the force of the tide. He can suction himself over his brood while he fans them with his fins to keep them well oxygenated. His rubber lips vacuum up algae and other organisms that might threaten his brood. But there is more to his job than housework. A crab eyes up the lumpfish caviar. But this little fish has balls. He will fearlessly see off intruders of any size. After a month of dedicated guard duty, he welcomes the arrival of babies. The little ones will spend a few months in shallow water, nibbling on seaweed. Eventually, they will swim off to the deep.
In the nearby seagrass meadows, there's another super dad, a greater pipe fish. He is a close cousin of the seahorse and is basically the same shape, only with the kinks ironed out. In seahorses and pipefish, it's the boys who wear the pregnancy pouch. Technically, they're not pregnant. When the male and female pipefish come together, the female lays her eggs into his brood pouch. He fertilizes them there and will supply nutrients from his body for the few weeks it takes them to develop. Now his 400 little ones are ready to hatch and he gently contracts his pouch to help them on their way. Many fish use the coastal shallows as a nursery, a slightly safer place to grow up than out at sea. And nowhere more so than in mangroves. The mangrove trees have a tangle of branching roots to help anchor them in soft mud. Safe play pens for young fish. Though unfortunately, also a good handrail for the green lava heron. The little fish dash for cover. The mangroves are gently tidal. For most fish, food is only available underwater. But the receding tide lays bare a smorgasbord of fallen vegetation stranded on the mud. And there is one group of fish who have evolved to exploit it. They've turned the usual pattern on its head. They hide in burrows when underwater, and as the tide retreats, they march up the beach. They have developed their own version of a shoulder joint and use their muscular fins to waddle and skip across the mud. They have a built-in oxygen tank, a bubble of water held in their gills. And as a backup, they can absorb O2 from the air through their wet skin. Though it would seem they have more freedom, roaming over both land and sea, they are surprisingly territorial and will fight over the tiniest patch of mud. Their fiery tempers are dampened by the returning tide. As the water level rises, larger fish move into the mangroves. Baby lemon sharks. They hang out in shoals, like the other fish, they use the mangroves to keep them away from the bigger sharks offshore. And with so many other fish babies using the mangrove nursery, they have plenty to eat.
Though in the end, shellfish hiding in the mud prove easier to catch than the speedy fish fry. Fish parenting techniques vary, with some fish dropping their eggs in a protective nursery and others building shelters. Not all fish are natural-born experts in construction and have to think outside the box in order to give their young a good start in life. In North America, the river chub has lips that belong in a kissing booth. But they're the tools of his trade. In the lead up to the spawning season, he's busy. Building a fortress of rocks that will protect his young. but build it, and they will come. There are many kinds of minnow, but not all are as good with their lips. These are freeloaders, uninvited guests. Without the building skills to decorate their own nurseries, they plan to exploit his. They vie to release their eggs and sperm into his rock castle. More than 20 different kinds of fish will take advantage of his hard work. It's not all bad for the chub. By surrounding his own eggs with theirs, they are improving his odds. If a predator raids the nest, the chances are it'll snatch their eggs, not his. In freshwater lakes, the baby pike are growing quickly and starting to resemble their torpedo-shaped parents. They have mastered ambush and acceleration. But are still getting to know their limits. Pike grow quickly, only taking a year or two to reach adult size. And now all of them are enjoying the bounty of summer. There are young, mouth-sized fish in abundance. It's vital for all of fish kind to find the right nursery to give their young the best start in life. That often means traveling great distances. In the ocean, fish movements are often triggered by ocean currents, some of which are constant, while others change with the seasons. For half the year, the Panama Current flows to Galapagos, bringing warm water from Central America. But in summer, it's pushed out by the cold Humboldt Current carrying nutrients from the southern seas to the tropics. The newly fertilized tropical seas attract ocean wanderers and reef fish alike. The cold water is a trigger for some of the ocean's most intimidating fish. Scalloped hammerheads are active and efficient predators. But they're not here to feed. They shoal together, females grouped in the middle and males around the edge. They're here to breed. Why they group and how mating happens 
remains a mystery. Mating sharks can be a bit rough, and many of the females end up with dramatic love bites. But the reef offers a solution. Reef fish are only too happy to clean the wounds of tasty parasites and dead skin. To get the health care they need, the sharks must prove that they're not going to hunt the fish. They do so with a secret handshake. A twist and wriggle. Barber fish answer the call. Soon the hammerheads are queuing up for the spa treatment. It's a win-win for sharks and the fish of the reef. A time of plenty, but not so for their fishy friends. Late summer brings austerity to the Amazon. The water levels have dropped. The fish no longer have access to the trees. In some areas, fish have been left in shrinking tributaries. For the giant arapaima, the stagnant water can't provide the oxygen it needs. But it has an enlarged swim bladder, the sack of air that most fish have to control their buoyancy. The arapaima uses it like a huge lung to gulp air and extract oxygen from it. But oxygen is not the only issue the water line brings. Trapped in the shrinking pools, the fish are more accessible to hunters from above. Egrets and storks flock to take advantage of their predicament. For fish survivors, shrinking pools leave them gasping for breath. It's a waiting game, hoping that rain will come before predators pick them off or the pools completely dry out. For some, it's the end of the line, and their last chance to leave a genetic legacy. Spotted killifish live life in the fast lane. They hatched at the start of the rainy season, but now, as their pools dry up, are at the end of the line. At the 11th hour, they rush to reproduce. The male cloaks the female with his colorful fin. Their eggs will lie dormant in the mud, long after their parents expire, waiting for rain to fall, bringing them to life. Summer brings bounty to some and hardship to others, but fish endure. And as summer draws to a close, one of the biggest events in the fishy calendar gets underway and it seems a host of predators have been circled in their diaries. Seven species of salmon in both the North Atlantic and Pacific Oceans take part in a mass movement, one of the longest animal migrations on Earth. Some species get started early in the year, but most start gathering in bays and estuaries in late summer. They have been living at sea for years, but now something deep-rooted in their DNA is calling them home, back to the place of their birth. But returning is not as easy as it sounds. Right now, the fish are big, strong and healthy, and hard to resist. The orca are back. for a fish feast. But the salmon don't sit around waiting to be eaten. They need to get inland. 
By the millions, they enter the rivers, quickly swimming beyond the orca's reach. A very long journey lies ahead. Their arrival has been long anticipated. Whether it's in Canada, Russia or Japan, everywhere brown bears live close to the coast. They know of the salmon run and return year on year to cash in. Each bear develops its own technique. fish carnage, a massacre. Each bear might pluck 30 fish a day from the shoal. And it's not just the loss of the fish, but the eggs it was carrying up river. It's a heavy toll, but the salmon are determined. In many areas, the river itself presents endless obstacles. The fish must hurl themselves against the rocks. And the powerful flow of water, not helped by the bears. try and get to calmer streams above. It's a test of endurance. But even now, while they're coping with the predators and natural forces, the salmon are undergoing massive changes. Finally, the current begins to relent. The usually sleek and silvery fish are becoming monsters. Like deer growing antlers for the breeding season, the salmon are preparing themselves for the fight of their lives. After weeks of slog and suffering, and after countless losses, the fish have reached quieter waters, tens of kilometers inland. But they're not in the clear. Otters. among the most agile of aquatic hunters. Perhaps the predators are weeding out the weakest. Any individual that makes it to the finishing line will pass on strong genes to its offspring. Despite the exhausting battle, which has taken some of the salmon over 3,000 kilometers, they're not done. The males must now face each other. They have changed shape, hunchbacked and dogged, with arched jaws and huge teeth. Only the fish with staying power will have the chance to spawn after they have muscled away the competition. The epic struggle is taking its toll. These are saltwater fish. They were born to the freshwater streams, but after a kindergarten upstream, they made the move to the ocean 
and went through huge physical changes to cope with a life at sea. The changes are not reversible. Now, after weeks in fresh water, their bodies are deteriorating. They are literally falling apart. This is a one-way trip. The exhausted females use their bodies to clear shallow depressions in the gravel and deposit several thousand eggs. A male that won the battle takes his chance and shimmies over the clutch, releasing his sperm to fertilize the eggs. It is their final act. Battered and beaten, the adults are at the end of the road. Their exhausted bodies can work no more. The life of fish is never easy. Even before they hatch, the salmon eggs are under attack. The dipper bobs beneath the surface. The eggs are a rich and easy source of protein. But even against the odds, millions of salmon will hatch and eventually head out to sea. And so the cycle continues. During their epic, dramatic lives, the salmon have fed whales, bears, otters, and dippers. But they still have so much more to give. After a vast die-off, the bodies of the adult salmon decay. Some will rot in the river. Others will be carried into the forest by scavengers. But either way, the nutrients in their bodies return to the earth. Vast forests, river systems and coastlines are entirely dependent on the salmon to fertilize them and ensure their health. One of the most graphic examples of how fish fuel the world. Earth wouldn't be the same without them, but they're under threat. Since the dawn of time, humans have invented technology to harvest fish. But as our population grew, so did our technologies. Traps and lines, small-scale fisheries, were replaced with industrial trawlers and factory ships. Today, nearly 40 million tons of fish are harvested every year. The flesh providing food to people all over the globe. But many populations have been overhunted and even wiped out. To try and take the pressure off wild fish and to keep a sustainable supply of meat, Breeding programs have been put in place to help repopulate the wild. Where baby fish can be hatched and nurtured until they're big enough to be released. Fish are vital and fascinating. Our relationship has always been one of exploitation and yet endless wonder. For our sakes and the health of the planet, the world needs to remain really fishy. <laughs> <laughs>